what is the aggregate root pattern in domain-driven design. This is one of the first tactical patterns that you will encounter when studying domain-driven design and in this video I'll explain what an aggregate root is and I'll give you some guidelines to designing good aggregates in your domain. I'm going to start by explaining what is an aggregate and from the diagram that you can see here you can begin to paint a picture of what an aggregate should represent and let's start by defining it as a collection of objects that are somehow grouped together. We're going to explain what is the reasoning behind all of this throughout this video but for now let's say that we have three aggregates here one containing the user with their followers, then we have another aggregate containing the activity and the corresponding likes and comments connected to this activity, and we also have an aggregate containing the workout together with the respective exercises. But before we dive into our exploration of aggregates, let's start by asking a simple question. Instead of asking what is an aggregate, why don't we start thinking about why do we need aggregates in the first place? So let's actually start the discussion by asking why do we need aggregates in the first place? One reason to introduce the concept of an aggregate to your domain is to guarantee the consistency of multiple changes being applied to a group of objects. This group of objects could have complex associations between them and the more complex the relationships between these objects, the harder it becomes to guarantee consistency inside of a transaction. One thing I want you to take away from this point is that I'm stressing the consistency inside of an aggregate here and not necessarily the relationships of the objects inside of the aggregate. Another reason to introduce an aggregate is because we want to maintain invariants in place that apply to this group of objects. And this is another important distinction. We want to enforce the consistency and the invariance on the group of objects making up the aggregate and not the individual objects. An invariant inside of our domain represents a business rule that we want to enforce and the actual meaning of the word invariant means never changing so we want our aggregates to help us enforce these invariants in a way that they cannot be broken from outside of the aggregate. These are the high level points of why we need aggregates. Now let's actually talk about what is an aggregate. The definition of an aggregate that I'm going to give you now is from the book Domain Driven Design Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software and it says that an aggregate is a cluster of associated or connected objects that we treat as a single unit for the purpose of data changes. In other words, we treat the aggregate as a transactional boundary inside of our domain and everything inside of the aggregate should remain consistent when we want to make data changes to the aggregate. Each aggregate has two important components, an object representing the aggregate root and an aggregate boundary. The aggregate boundary defines what belongs inside of the aggregate and this boundary is mostly logical as you will see, however we are going to design it in such a way that we enforce this boundary through our code. The aggregate root is a single object or entity that is contained inside of the aggregate and we use this aggregate root to be able to identify the entire aggregate. In light of everything I just said, let's go back to the diagram from the start and take a closer look at the components that we have here. What I highlighted here are three distinct aggregates inside of a specific domain and you can see that each aggregate has a clear boundary encapsulating the objects that belong inside of the aggregate. You can also see that we have references crossing the aggregate boundaries, however the references are pointed to specific objects, the user, the activity and the workout, which could lead us to believe that these objects represent the aggregate roots. And this is because these are the objects that I picked to be the aggregate roots of the respective aggregates. So the workout entity is the aggregate root for this entire aggregate, then the user entity will represent the aggregate root for this aggregate, and the activity entity represents the aggregate root for this aggregate. So let's continue our discussion about aggregates and talk about more constraints that our aggregates need to follow. An important rule of designing aggregates is that the aggregate root is the only member of the aggregate that should be visible from the outside. You were able to see this in the previous diagram when I highlighted how the relationships flow between the aggregates and we were only using the aggregate roots to represent the direction of the relationships. So this is a constraint that we have from the outside looking into the aggregate. We can only reference the aggregate root and we use the aggregate root to communicate with the other objects belonging to the aggregate. However, from inside of the aggregate, other objects that belong to the aggregate are allowed to hold references to each other. Another way to look at it is in terms of identity, aggregate roots have global identity inside of our domain, while the entity objects inside of an aggregate have local identity relative to the aggregate itself. Let's take a closer look at two aggregates, for example the activities aggregate 
and the workouts aggregate and I place the aggregate root on the boundary of the aggregate to make it really obvious that this is the only part of the aggregate that is public facing. Everything inside of the aggregate boundary is internal to the aggregate and shouldn't be accessible to the outside. So if the activity aggregate wants to interact with the workout aggregate, it's going to do so by referencing the workout entity. For example, if the activity needs some information about the exercises for a particular workout, it's going to request this information from the workout aggregate root. Inside of the aggregate itself, you can have one or more entities, like the likes and comments for a particular activity. You can also have a bunch of supporting value objects that you need to express this aggregate's design. And for example, in the workouts aggregate, we have the exercises being an entity, and we also have some value objects like distance, duration, and interval. I also want to give you some guidelines for designing a good aggregate, but in reality, a lot of this is going to be trial and error, and you figuring out how to express your domain in the best way possible. But let's start with a first rule for designing our aggregate. You want to protect your invariants inside of the aggregate boundaries. And this is really the most important concept to grasp about aggregates. They are not necessarily about the relationships between the many objects that you could have inside of an aggregate. The most important thing to understand about aggregates is that they represent a consistency boundary inside of your domain, inside of which the invariants always need to be true. Another rule I'm going to give you is to try to design your aggregates to be as small as possible, because this reduces the surface area for things to go wrong. If you are working with small aggregates, it's easier to enforce consistency rules, and there is a smaller chance for concurrency conflicts to appear. When it comes to interacting with other aggregates, we only want to reference them by the identity or the ID of the aggregate root of the other aggregate, and sometimes we will need to update one aggregate from another. What you want to do in this case is to try to update the other aggregate eventually by publishing a domain event, and then the messaging component will subscribe to this event and update the other aggregate. So I mentioned that two aggregates should be eventually consistent, and we want to communicate any changes using domain events. However, should this always be the case, and is this always possible in practice? Really, this is going to depend on your specific requirements. If you need immediate consistency between multiple aggregates, then you should consider merging them into one aggregate to make them part of the same consistency boundary. Otherwise, if you can tolerate some eventual consistency, then you should be using domain events. And now let's jump into a practical example of an aggregate. What you see here is the workout aggregate from our previous diagram, which contains its ID, which represents the aggregate identity, and we're also encapsulating a list of exercises which belong to this particular aggregate, or in other words, which belong to this particular workout. We made the collection of exercises a private field inside of the workout class so that we can only manipulate it through the workout aggregate route and if anyone wants to add or remove exercises they have to go through the methods that we expose on the aggregate route however some of these methods are poorly designed and they don't follow the guidelines that i talked about earlier so we are going to slightly refactor our aggregate to improve the design so let's first look at the method to add an exercise to our aggregate it accepts a few arguments representing what we need to create an exercise and we are calling the exercise create factory method to try to create a new instance. If we fail to do this, we are going to return the respective failure result. Otherwise, we are going to append the exercise itself to the list of exercises and complete this method. The create method itself is internal to our domain, which means it can't be called outside of our domain assembly, which is another way how we can use C-sharp constructs, such as the internal access modifier, to help us encapsulate the invariants inside of the domain. The exercise entity also has its own identity, but you can see here that it's referencing the aggregate root using the workout ID property, and we have a few value objects that describe the exercise entity. Now, if I go back to the workout, what I meant when I said bad design is the remove exercise method, because we are accepting an exercise entity outside of the aggregate root, which means somebody would need to obtain a copy of the exercise somehow. We will see how this is going on in just a moment. And I also wanted to comment on the exercises property. The problem with this property is that it's exposing a list which is a mutable collection. Now the safeguard in this example is calling the toList method when returning from this property, which is going to return back a copy. But a better design would be to expose a read-only collection or a read-only list Let's, for example, choose a read-only list. And this is a more appropriate way to expose your collections because you can't add or remove elements from a read-only list. Now let's go back to the remove method. 
If I go to the only reference of this method, you will see that we were calling it from a use case to remove an exercise with a specific ID. How can we refactor this to encapsulate this invariant inside of our domain? Instead of looking for the exercise and then calling the remove exercise method, we can take the exercise ID that we have here and pass it as an argument to this method. Then I'm going to take the code that we had here and I'm going to move it into the remove exercise method. So we are pushing logic down into the domain, but we also have to update the return from this method. So now it's going to return a result object. Let's make that explicit. And I will have to check the status of this result. And in case it's a failure, I'm going to return that failure result. If we succeed, then we are going to persist the changes in the database by calling the unit of work. Now let's go back to the workout aggregate and update the remove exercise method. So it has to return a result object. And instead of accepting an exercise, it's going to accept an exercise ID. Now I'm going to add the code that I took out from the use case itself. And I can use the exercises collection to try to find an exercise with this particular ID. If this exercise is not part of the aggregate, we're going to return an error result back. Otherwise, we're going to remove this exercise from the collection and we're going to return from this method with a success result. And now the only way to remove an exercise is to pass the exercise ID to the aggregate root. And from the use case perspective, we would only be calling a public method on the aggregate root object. If you enjoyed this video, then I think this is the perfect video for you to watch next. Also, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, stay awesome.